Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. Okay, today we are talking again about Disney and our boy Ron DeSantis and this parental rights law and how it is still making waves. And Ron DeSantis is taking some special treatment away from Disney because of their reaction response to the parental rights in education bill known by its critics as the don't say gay bill. So we're going to talk about that. It says a lot about the culture wars, the future of conservatism, the definition of conservatism. It's a very interesting and important and I think kind of exciting moment when it comes to our political scene. And we're also going to talk about how the White House is responding to all of this. And then I'm going to react to some crazy TikTok videos at the end of it. So it'll be a good, fun, episode. But before we get into that, let me start with something even even more fun than the rest of what we are going to talk about. And that is the conversation that I was having with my team before the cameras turned on. I wish that you guys could have heard the conversation and in the future, we're going to like make this a segment, some kind of throwback Thursday where we are talking about something from the early 2000s where we're re- reminiscing on. And what I was what I was reminiscing on today was the Backstreet Boys and boy bands. That's what we were just discussing because the Backstreet Boys are on tour. And I don't think you have ever met a bigger Backstreet Boys fan than I was when I was in like second grade. I mean, I had most of their albums. I had a Backstreet Boys nightgown. I had Backstreet Boys posters in my room when I was in, I don't know, probably second to fourth grade were really like my prime Backstreet Boys years. Guys, I used to listen to their, I think it was their either Millennium album or their Back in Blue album and cry cry when I was little thinking that, oh my gosh, what if I don't meet them one day? I can't, I can't reconcile (laughs) with that possibility. And I would also think about what I would wear to their concert. Would I, I'm like in second grade. So would I look, try to like look really cute so that they might like notice me (laughs) and be like, wow, you know, that girl's so awesome. Or would I want to wear like a Backstreet Boys shirt so they know that I'm a really big Backstreet Boys fan? Because either way, they would look out into the crowd and be like, wow, that is an awesome fan right there. So those are the kinds of things that I would think about. My parents did not let me go to a Backstreet Boys concert. And they did, though, they let me listen to their music. Maybe not all of their music, but they did let me listen to their music. But they didn't let me listen to Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears, which I'm glad about because I shouldn't have been listening to them. But then when I think back at some of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC stuff, I'm like, oh, I'm not I'm not so sure. And I remember the story of I was probably in second grade and I think I maybe got either like a VHS or a DVD. I probably this was a DVD time in in our history. And it was a It was a live Backstreet Boys concert that you could watch on your TV. And of course, I was so excited to watch them, uh, to watch this. And there was a combination of two bad things happening at the same time when my dad walked in and uh, got very upset and made me stop watching this. So just if you don't want to hear me say, uh, say, say this phrase, then maybe you should skip forward or not let your children hear but there is I think it's in Backstreet's Back All Right they are singing the song and there's a part of the song where I think it's AJ he says oh my god we're back again and in this concert he also happens to rip his shirt off at the same time and my dad walked in while he was saying OMGOD and ripping his shirt off and it was like game over. I think I was in trouble somehow and I wasn't allowed to watch that anymore. And when you think about boy bands, like that whole combination that I just described and just boy bands in general, it's a very weird concept. I decided to reminisce some more last night and I watched this this video, this live performance by NSYNC singing, I just got paid, you know, just got paid. Friday night and they were um they had fake money 
falling from the ceiling and they did this dance move where they turned around and they shook their booties while they were spanking their their, their behinds. And I'm like, why did, why at that point were they like heartthrobs for young women? Because it's actually kind of feminine what they're doing with all of like the frosted tips and the gelled hair. And it's not attractive or masculine in the slightest, all of these coordinated dances. And yet this was the thing at the time. Very odd concept. Very odd concept. I'm glad that we have evolved from that. I'm glad that we left that behind. However, I would absolutely still see Backstreet Boys in concert to this day, just so my eight-year-old self could be satisfied knowing that I did finally accomplish that dream. And all of those tears were for naught because I was able to see them in concert. That's what we were talking about. That's the nostalgia that we were replaying before this. And I hope it's brought you back. What What was your favorite boy band? Was it 98 Degrees? Were you a renegade like that? That you decided that you were just going to get out of the battle of the boy bands between NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, the two mainstream ones? And you decided to go with 98 Degrees or maybe it was someone else. I don't even know who else was out there. Or was it Sync? Or was it Backstreet Boys? What was your favorite song? Were you one of those cool people whose parents allowed them to go to concerts? Because I, I was not. And now looking back, it's probably a good thing, but I was very sad at the time. So I would love to hear your memories of that. I would love to hear your favorite boy band. So message me, tell me about that, and maybe I'll talk about it again on our next Throwback Thursday. All right, just wanted to loop you in on some important behind-the-scenes conversations that we have before the filming of Relatable. Let's actually get into what we are talking about today. Before we do, let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is GenuCell. If you are looking for a great topical way to look your best to make sure that your skin is healthy and as firm as possible, especially if you are getting to to be old like me who just hit 30, but you know, you're not looking for any kind of invasive treatment like Botox or something like that, then maybe you need to look into a really good skincare um, regimen like the one that GenuCell has. They have a new ultra retinol cream that is made with concentrated hyaluronic acid. This technological wonder hydrates your skin at a cellular level and builds on the deep moisture with the incredible anti-aging effects of a natural retinol alternative. For soft, nourishing, and silky smooth skin without the harsh side effects of retinol. Go to GenuCell.com slash Allie now for up to 50% off the new, the brand new Ultra Retinol Cream. You'll also get GenuCell immediate effects for results in 12 hours or less free with your order. That's a great deal. Go to GenuCell.com slash Allie. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash alley. Free express shipping, free returns, exquisite customer service, and 100% money back satisfaction guarantee. Go to GenuCell.com slash alley. That's GenuCell.com slash alley. Okay, so Ron DeSantis, a personal favorite around here and among most Republicans, He is, according to the AP, repealing a law or the Florida Senate on Wednesday repealed uh, passed a bill to repeal a law allowing Walt Disney World to operate a private government over its properties in the state. They currently have this district that basically gets to do what they want. They don't get to flout all laws, obviously, but they basically get to set their own rules But the Florida Senate, the Florida legislature, legislature, along with Ron DeSantis, they're now pushing back against that and saying, look, if you are going to battle against Florida parents and Floridians, the majority of whom actually support this parental rights and education bill, once they are actually read the bill and they actually read what's in the bill, they don't just hear the propaganda from the mainstream media calling this don't say gay. Once they see that this is a law that covers kindergartners through third graders and just prohibits schools from keeping secrets about that child's well-being uh, from the parents and prohibits formal classroom discussion about things like sexual orientation and gender identity. The vast majority of parents, including Democrat parents, say, yeah, you know, I think that's good. I think that that's probably my responsibility to teach those very sensitive topics to my kids in a way that is best for them, that accommodates their particular maturity level level and their particular needs and the needs of our family. And you'll hear a lot of distortions that this means that gay teachers can't talk about paddle 
skateboarding with their gay partner over the weekend. That's not at all what this is, although I don't really think that you should be talking to kindergartners through third graders about that kind of thing, like about your personal life, but that's not prohibited by this law. And it doesn't prevent teachers from reporting abuse or protecting children from potential abuse or neglect at home. Teachers in Florida, as in most states, they are mandatory reporters. So if they suspect actual abuse and and neglect, they are Um, they are required by law to report that. And so all this bill does is to protect the rights of parents to teach their kids about these very sensitive topics in a way that they consent to, in a way that they know about, in the way that they want to. And again, this is kindergartners through third graders. I think it should extend beyond that, but that's what this law is. It is covering kindergartners through third graders. And the reaction to this from the media, from the White House, from Democrats is extremely revealing. It's extremely revealing. So in that way, I actually think that the narrow scope of this covering kindergartners through third graders is actually good for that reason, because you're realizing just how much they hate, just how much leftist indoctrinators hate not being able to disciple and manipulate and shape the minds of very young children. Kindergartners through third graders, that's five to nine year olds. And the bill says, sorry, you can't talk to them about switching their gender. You can't talk to them about sexual orientation and sexuality at that age. The fact that anyone would oppose that, the fact that anyone would have any problem with that. Yeah, that is why we are having a conversation about what grooming looks like. Grooming isn't necessarily specifically targeting a child for sexual abuse yourself. It is also introducing children to confusing and very mature and quite frankly, immoral topics um, that are priming them for decisions and for thoughts that they just aren't ready to have yet, especially without the presence, the knowledge and the consent of their parents. But this is queer theory. If you know anything about critical theory, which if you listen to this podcast, you very much do. You're basically an expert on critical theory because of how much we have cited primary sources and talked about it and talked to experts about it. You know critical race theory very well at this point, but queer theory is a part of critical theory. And in the same way that critical race theory in very simplistic terms, divides the world between white and black, white oppressors and black and brown oppressed and basically sees everything through that lens so queer theory separates people between queer and cis heteronormative of course these are terms that were developed in the 60s and 70s by very perverse sexologists that were looking to normalize things like cross-dressing and gender switching especially in children there is as we talked about a couple weeks ago we'll link this past episode there's a dark history of gender grooming it does not start from a place its origins are not in a place of inclusion or tolerance or empathy or science or trying to understand people better and making space for different kinds of people and expressions its roots are very perverse and extremely dark and extremely predatory and queer theory is a part of all of that. Uh, Remember, progressivism as an ideology has a very different idea of human nature. Whereas Christians, um, because critical theory really is in direct competition to Christian thought, they don't go together at all, you can't dovetail them, you can't use critical theory as a tool of biblical interpretation, unlike some even evangelical Christians uh, think that you can, You, you just can't because they are completely opposed. They have a different view, first of all, of human nature, whereas Christians see that we are made in the image of God and that we have inherited and innate rights because of that. We have innate worth because of that. God tells us who we are. Our bodies are part of who we are. We are made, um, as Genesis 1 says, male and female, that is a part of being made in God's image that is an important part of who we are. Our bodies have a purpose. It can't be changed by declaration. It can't be changed by thought. It can't be changed 
by feeling. Remember, progressivism really doesn't believe in human nature like that. They really believe that human beings are able to just kind of be molded as society and ideology and cultural and social trends see fit, or as the mind sees fit. This has a long philosophical history going back hundreds of years. This idea that we really don't have any kind of fixed nature that people can be changed and molded as those in charge want them to be changed and molded or as they declare themselves to be. And you should definitely read Love Thy Body by Nancy Piercy, who does a brilliant job of discussing all of this. So our differences, our disagreements about whether or not a man can become a woman, whether or not we should be talking to little kids about this stuff really goes back to Genesis 1, as all things do. Like, who do you believe is in charge? Who do you believe made us? How did he make us? Why did he make us? What do our bodies actually mean? Until we understand the fundamentals of this and the fundamental disagreements between queer theory and critical theory and Christianity and Christian thought, like we're not going to be able to have real productive, real productive, substantive conversations about this. And that's part of the reason also why I just completely am against any form of conservatism that isn't conserving the basics of Genesis 1, that God made us male and female. That's what gender is. That's what the family is. That's what procreation should look like, because that is the basis for conservatism. If we're not conserving the most fundamental part of human existence and the nucleus of society, which is the family, then we're not going to get all of these other parts of conservatism um, that we want. A lot of people disagree with that, but that's just the case. I mean, It'll take a a few years just to prove us right. And actually, we are seeing it being proven right right now. We've abandoned all of those fundamentals, biblical fundamentals as a society. And now we are getting people who think that it's okay to talk to little kids about transitioning and being a different gender. As Libs of TikTok shows us on a daily basis, there are many teachers who are so brazen to talk about their predation and talking about these kinds of things on TikTok. And she shares those things. And as I've said, progressivism is like mold. It likes to spread in the dark and it doesn't like light to be shown on it and exposed. And that's exactly what Lives of TikTok does. That's exactly what we have to do. That's exactly what the uh, Florida bill, uh, a Florida bill does. So anyway, it's a good bill. It's a good law. And obviously Disney World with their um, wokeness and the ideology that they purport and also their very troubling history of having employees that have been booked for child sexual predation. They are against this and lots of Democrats and the White House have rallied alongside them. And Florida has said to loop all the way back. I know we kind of went on a detour to loop all the way back. Ron DeSantis has said, look, you're not going to get special privileges if you do this. If you push back against Floridians and if you act that way, basically if you threaten us, they've threatened to leave and they tried to basically wage war against this law in Ron DeSantis. And Ron DeSantis said, sorry, you're not going to get the special privileges that you have enjoyed for so long if you wage war against Floridians. DeSantis wrote in a campaign fundraising email on Wednesday, if Disney wants to pick a fight, they chose the wrong guy. As governor, I was elected to put the people of Florida first, and I will not allow a woke corporation based in California to run our state. And so they're taking away some of the privileges that this district enjoyed. It was called, or it is called, the Reedy Creek Improvement District, and the control it gave Disney over 27,000 acres in Florida was a crucial element. This is according to the AP and the company's plans to build near Orlando in the 1960s. Company officials said they needed autonomy to plan a futuristic city along with the theme park. The city never materialized. However, instead it morphed into an Epcot theme park, but they were still able to, as I said in the beginning, kind of set the rules that they wanted to. And Republicans are now saying, I'm sorry, you're not going to enjoy these privileges if you're going to wage this kind of war. Look, I think this is a great thing. There are Republicans, a lot of Democrats, but a lot of Republicans saying that, oh, this is not good. You are basically, you are punishing a corporation for their free speech. And we need to be pro-free speech. And we don't want this to be weaponized against 
conservatives or conservative companies, it's going to get in the wrong hands if a Democrat wants to do the same thing or ever runs the state of Florida. Having something like this on the books just sets a bad precedent. But I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Like we are past we're past that stage. The fact of the matter is, is that corporations are way too powerful. They have way too much influence in the United States. And it was never a conservative principle to give this kind of corporation a special privilege. A privilege is not a right. The company does not have a right to have an autonomous district where they get to run the show how they want to and they have their own rules. That was a privilege that the state at one point decided to allow them. But now, Disney has decided to wage war against the values of the majority of the people in the state. And I think the people in power have every right to say, look, you have your rights. You can say what you want to say. That's fine. You have the ability to do that. We're not, you know, shutting down the theme park. It's not like they put caution tape around the gates of Magic Kingdom. Like people are still able to go as they want to, but they're saying those privileges, not those rights, those privileges that you enjoyed are now going to be taken away. This is how you play ball. This is, I'm sorry, whether you like it or not, this is the future of the GOP and it has to be. And as for the argument that, well, Democrats are just going to do this, newsflash, Democrats are going to do it anyway. Don't you see that? Democrats already weaponize major companies against conservatives. That already happens. They don't need precedent to do that. They don't need Ron DeSantis to set an example. Don't you see how the White House and Democrats already collude with big tech to push down the voices that they don't want heard? To try to stop the circulation of stories like the Hunter Biden laptop that they don't want circulating before an election? Don't you see how they already come together to try to deplatform narratives and people and voices and opinions and dissent that they don't like, they already do this. I mean, they are already in bed with some of the biggest and most powerful corporations in the country to push the agenda that they want to push. When's the last time that you saw a progressive author or progressive, uh, a progressive voice get kicked off one of these major platforms because they said something that was, you know, legitimate, but just kind of unpopular outside of the mainstream. That happens all the time to conservatives. They're always threatened to get kicked off platforms because they say true things like a man can't become a woman. That doesn't happen on the other side. It doesn't matter how many false narratives Nicole Hannah Jones or someone on the left pushes. It doesn't matter how often they say something that isn't true, like a man can become a woman. If you are Charlie Kirk or you are the Babylon Bee or you are Tucker Carlson or you are Megan Murphy or one of these people who have stated the truth about gender, like you're going to get your platform yanked away from you. Or maybe you're going to get shadow bans. You're going to be put on a bad list. And Democrats are all for this. They want more censorship. And so we don't need precedent. Democrats don't need precedent to weaponize major corporations against their dissent. They're already doing that in a much more malicious and cruel way than any Republican has. And for people who say that they are anti-fascist, guess what a form of fascism is? It is the wedding of corporate and government power, something that Democrats have been very good at for a long time. And if we are truly conservatives, then we're not just against overwhelming and oppressive government power. We are against any large bureaucracy trying to uh, trying to suppress our voices or trying to um, uh, oppress us really in any way. And so like if we have, for example, Amazon, this is an old story. This is back in 2020. And it they reportedly decided not to help with the distribution of vaccines until after Biden took office. They had the capability of doing that when Trump was still in office, but then they decided not to help out until Biden was in office. I know there are lots of different thoughts about um, the vaccine, but they believed, obviously, that it was going to be this life-saving thing. And they decided it was more important to suspend this life-saving vaccine um, for, uh, for political reasons, because they didn't like Trump. Like that is the government colluding with corporations to mistreat people, to discriminate against people. And conservatives should be against that. We should be against corporatism. At one point, liberals were also against corporatism. 
They were against um, government power trying to take people's rights away, not in the constitutional sense, because I understand the Constitution is limiting government power, but in the sense that rights actually can be restricted by major corporations insofar as they limit your ability to freely and significantly exercise those rights, especially when platforms like Twitter so dominate the conversation. And then they say, well, you know, just create a new platform. Well, Parler did that. And then Amazon and the Amazon server and then the Apple store and Google all colluded to take Parler down temporarily. And so it's all, it's, it's, it's just all a joke when people say, oh, well, We should just not worry about what corporations are doing. We should be pro-corporation. I'm not so sure. And I don't think most Republicans want that anymore. Look, the only way to battle woke capital is through things like this. And if Republicans are not going to do what they can with the power that they have when they have it to push back against these corporations that are basically throwing up a middle finger to the Americans that don't share their values, the many millions of Americans that don't share their values, then really what are Republicans good for? Gone are the days of Republicans just being the the party of tax cuts and the party of deregulation. That's a good thing. Like, those are good. I like tax cuts. I like deregulation for sure. Those are all great things. But I want a GOP that's going to go to war. I want a GOP that's not going to play nice with the powers that be, whether they're corporate or whether they are in the government. That's what we want. We want someone who is going to fight on our behalf. And I saw this tweet, I think it was from Aaron McIntyre. He said, the party or the side that wants to win is always going to beat the side that wants to be left alone. Ain't that the truth? And for too long, Republicans have just been the party of, we just want to be left alone. And look, I'm not talking about any kind of I'm not talking about any kind of massive, big government, tyrannical takeover here. I'm talking about the realization that nothing is neutral. We're not going back to just neutral. Because unfortunately, the left doesn't want their corporations or institutions to be neutral. I think most conservatives would love that. Like we would just love public education and academia to just teach reading, writing, and arithmetic and for corporations to be completely apolitical, but that's not the game that the left has decided to play. They have decided to be the imperialists that they are. They have decided to say, we are going to take over and destroy every once apolitical and neutral institution that exists, and we are going to make it into our image. And then when the right comes along and says, oh, no, I don't like your ideas. Those are bad ideas. I want my ideas to be what's shaping curriculum. I want my ideas to be the ones that are pushed forward. Then you are accused for just pushing back in a kind but, uh, you know, pointed way. You are accused of being a Christian nationalist. You're accused of being a fascist. You're accused of being an authoritarian. It's all projection. It's kind of like, you know, that victim complex that someone does something to you, they do something really mean, and then when you respond or when you say, hey, this person is doing this bad thing, this person is doing this mean or stupid or whatever thing, then that person who first did the bad thing claims that they are a victim because someone talked about the fact that they are doing the bad thing. Um, it's, and that's kind of the role that the left plays, but you can't fall into it. They claim that they are not waging a culture war, that they're, what? they're just standing up for rights. They're just standing up for, you know, inclusion and tolerance. No, they're not. They hate you, they hate your views, and they believe that a democracy means less, uh, fewer voices that sound like yours, that sound like Christian conservatism. So what I'm talking about is that we no longer come with like a plastic spoon to a knife fight. Um, and look, I'm using a metaphor here, okay? We're not condoning violence. I'm talking about a battle of ideas. We cannot come to the table with neutrality. We have to come to the table saying, you know what? I don't like this curriculum that is in Florida schools or is in my schools. Here's the curriculum that I think that we should be teaching. I think our kids should be learning the classics. I think our kids should know about the Bible and learn about the Bible in schools. It doesn't mean that the teacher has to say, you know, this is a revelation from God, but they need to know the Bible because it is the most influential uh, book in the entire 
history of the world and also happened to lay the foundation for Western civilization, I think that they should learn about the family. I think that they should learn um, if they're going to learn this in an age appropriate way that being a boy is good, being a girl is good. Like we need to not be afraid to push back with good ideas. I'm not talking about right wing imperialism. I am talking about replacing the bad ideas of leftism with the good ideas of conservatism and not letting corporations or any institution get away with their bullying. Because when you call out the bully and you push back against the bully and they say, oh, you're the one that's you're the one that's bullying. You don't need to respond and say, oh, I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. You need to do what Ron DeSantis does and you just need to double down. You need to double down. Corporations should not get special privileges. They shouldn't. I mean, they just they just shouldn't, especially in in this way when they are waging war against parents and average Floridians. They just they just shouldn't. Really, that is as I said before, anti-conservative because that's the government picking and choosing winners. That's not capitalism. That's not a free market. That is some sort of crony capitalism. You could even say that's some sort of fascism if you wanted to go there. That is the government colluding with corporations and corporations getting so powerful that they actually impact your life to the point to where you can't fully exercise your rights as a parent or as a person. That's not good. So whether you like it or not, like this is the future hopefully, I hope, the future of the Republican Party. Are there limits to this? Yes. But I think Ron DeSantis, I think this is a strategic move. I think it's a good move. I was thinking about a way to describe Ron DeSantis the other day. And it, this is how I would describe just his just like win after win after win. He goes out of his way to do the right thing. There are so many things that he doesn't have to do, but then he does just because it's awesome. I mean, obviously from my conservative perspective, like he didn't have to do this. I think people would have probably forgot about forgotten about the whole Disney thing if a couple weeks passed and he did something else, but then he just doubles down. And I I really like how he treats the adversarial reporters and the Democrats is he's just kind of he just kind of rebuffs them. And then he moves on. He doesn't get into these petty fights and he doesn't get into Twitter wars. And he doesn't get into all of this just like personal stuff like other Republican leaders have and do that really wastes a lot of time. It is really just narcissistic. He seems to actually be representing the needs and the concerns of conservatives. And I love it. I hope that there are a hundred more Ron DeSantis's in Congress and state legislatures governors come on like model your governorship model your political moves after ron DeSantis in the florida legislature because they really are setting the tone and democrats who are freaking out saying oh well you know it's not just florida they're not it's not an isolated incident you're absolutely right from your lips to god's ears i've got more to say about this in just a second let me tell you about our second sponsor for the day and it's very pertinent to what we're talking about now, and that is Heroes of Liberty. So at one point, Disney and Scholastic were the storytellers of our childhoods. Unfortunately, these are no longer the purveyors of family-friendly material and content for our children. The culture they create is trying to brainwash kids into a new dystopian world with no God, no gender, nor no real sense of right and wrong or objective truth. And that's just not what we want our kids to learn. It's not good for them. It's not good for society. Thankfully, Heroes of Liberty is an alternative. It's a new, stunning, and beautifully illustrated series of children's books packed with American values, one story at a time. They're publishing biographies of heroes of liberty, such as Thomas Sowell, my favorite, Ronald Reagan, another favorite, John Wayne, Margaret Thatcher, Amy Coney Barrett, with more heroes being added every month. We've got three of their books. I think we've got the Ronald Reagan, the Amy Coney Barrett, and the Thomas Sowell, and we just love them. They really are so beautifully illustrated, and the story is really compelling and really clearly written. This is a perfect book, especially for maybe a little older kids. I would say probably like 6 to 12 is the prime age for these books, but of course they can be educational and entertaining for kids of all ages. One book, one hero every month. If you go to heroesofliberty.com discount, discount code Alley, you subscribe and then they send you those books. Um, you will receive a free book with my code and with the 1995 uh, sorry, $19.95 subscription program. So go to heroesofliberty.com discount code 
Allie for that discount. Go to heroesofliberty.com, discount code Allie. Let me play you how this is all being so misconstrued by the White House. This is Jin Psaki talking to Chris Wallace, who is now on CNN Plus. And I hear that CNN Plus just isn't doing too well. And of course, we we shed a very sincere tear for that. But, you know, Chris Wallace, I still think is a great interviewer. And what a mistake leaving Fox News. But anyway, here is part of his interview with Jin Psaki, where she totally misconstrues what's going on here, as usual. Don't parents have a right to have concern? I mean, we're talking specifically here about teaching about sex in kindergarten through third grade. I have to say, as a parent, I would have problems with that. But the law is not about teaching sex education. It's about teaching about gender identity. And so what, what do you do if a parent or a kid, should I say a kid in one of these elementary schools, says, what about Sally? Sally has two moms. Or I'm not sure if I'm a girl or a boy. I mean, these are kids who are experiencing um, you know, these moments in their lives. I also think that these are not... There is not a big record of there being either sex education or extensive gender identity education in these schools. And this is creating a problem or a political cudgel about an issue that I don't think exists. So many things here. First of all, if Sally has two moms, she's allowed to talk about that. A student is allowed to talk about that. And a teacher would be allowed to say, you know, Sally has two moms. Again, that is not what this law is about. This is prohibiting official classroom discussion, kindergartners through third graders about sexual orientation and gender identity. Jin Saki says, you know, what if a what if a little kid says, I don't know if I'm a boy or a girl? Well, then that's a real problem, isn't that, Jin Saki? And I don't want a teacher to be handling that. That means that a parent who loves that child and knows that child so much more than any bureaucrat or teacher or administrator or member of the, the Biden administration does. They need to know that. They need to know that that child is confused. And those parents, of course, I believe need to reaffirm to that child, no, God made you a girl. God made you a boy. Oh, it's okay, uh, little Sally, if you like dirt bikes and you like to wear overalls instead of dresses, that's okay. God made you a girl. So the parent can handle that however they want to. But it's really troubling that Jin Saki thinks that it's apparently normal and good and the, and the role of a teacher to, I don't know, hold some kind of discussion about why Sally is confused about whether or not she is a boy or a girl. That's really, really disturbing to me. Um, and then, of course, she goes on to say that this is not something that's happening, that gender identity and sex education, that that's not really happening in schools. Unfortunately, even in an informal way, it absolutely is happening. You guys tell me all the time. You think that you live in a conservative district, a conservative area. You thought that your public school or even your private school was immune to this kind of thing. And then you tell me the kind of curriculum that your child is coming home talking about or seeing. I saw this worksheet that is apparently standard in a lot of public schools for uh, sophomores across the country, sophomores in high school. And it was explaining how how important it is to use someone's preferred pronouns. It gave 10 reasons for why you need to use someone's preferred pronouns. And it's basically psychological and emotional manipulation. It's moral manipulation. It's moral extortion is what it is. It basically 10 reasons why you're a bad person if you don't call a man who calls himself a woman, she says you're showing that you're not safe. You're showing that you don't care about their feelings. You're showing that you're not a trustworthy person. And of course, a young person who just wants to be accepted, who just wants to be popular, who just wants to be liked and who doesn't want to be thought badly of by their peers or by their teacher. They're just going to say they're going to be morally extorted successfully. I mean, of course, that's what the left does. They know that these minds are so moldable. They're so malleable. They're so impressionable. And they don't just teach them things and say, okay, here is what it means to have gender dysphoria. But they actually say, if you do not accept this, which is the equivalent of two plus two equals five, then you are a bad person. That is 1984. That is dystopian. Like that is Orwellian. 
That's what's happening in schools across the country. So a law like this, I think a law that goes even further beyond K through third grade is absolutely necessary. And we as conservatives, as Christians especially, need to be involved in pushing back against this stuff. Whether your kids go to public school or not, you have a stake in your community. So you should care about what's going on in your city council and your school board, in the public schools, in your area. You're a taxpayer. And so you help fund that kind of thing. And so you absolutely should have a say and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I saw this terrible story and I see these a lot. This was a Reddit post and it was by a parent wanting some support for their child. And this typically is in the detransitioner subreddit, but I don't think that this one was. Someone reposted it on Twitter and it was this mom asking desperately for help um, for their child. So she says this, I have always been in support of my transgender daughter. When she was still a boy and started expressing a want to be a girl, I did everything right. Therapist, then puberty blockers, everything, everything right. Because, of course, there are people telling this woman that this is everything right and parents want to do what's best for their child and they are also morally extorted. They are told, hey, your child's going to commit suicide if you don't go in this direction. So now this mom said now she is 20 something, but she is, she is 20, but she's actually talking about her son, but I'm using her language. Now she is 20 and everything is falling apart. We had to hold off on the bottom surgery because of cost, but now finally had enough and went and got several consults. All have said the same thing. The puberty blockers have left her with a micro penis. That's such a dystopian sentence in and of itself. She has to get part of her vagina made with a colon. Well, one of her friends had that surgery and even years later, it smells fairly colon like. Obviously, my daughter is now distraught. She is in counseling, but is becoming worse and worse in her mental state, and I am frantic. On top of this, she has never had any sexual function, no urges, no erections. Even when she tried, um, sorry, this is graphic, but even when she tried masturbation to see if she could stimulate herself, nothing. The doctors say this may not change even after surgery. Her dating life is dismal as well. We knew it would be hard, but it is impossible. The one man who has had who was with her for a while, soon just became frustrated by her lack of sexual anything and broke it off. I don't know what to do. A friend suggested I post here for advice. Please help me help my child. This is devastating. This is absolutely devastating. This is not an isolated case. I mean, this is the reality of puber- puberty blockers. This is chemical castration. This is what happens when you put a child on, chemi- uh, on pu- uh, puberty blockers. It is chemical castration. And they are never the same. If this person decides that, okay, you know what? I think it was a mistake and I want to be a male again. Well, he is never going to have sexual function. He's never going to have normal genitalia. He cannot erase the physical and psychological experiences that he has had while being on puberty blockers. You know that puberty is important, not just for your body, but also for your mind. Like Your mind changes a lot during puberty. And you are disrupting a natural process, which yes, is a form of abuse. Because a child who doesn't even have their frontal lobe developed yet might be a little confused or maybe they were told at school that because they like some like some things that the opposite sex typically likes that maybe that means that they aren't really the gender that they were born with. This is the product of this kind of ideology. Like this is the product of this kind of thing. And the White House recently put out on the so-called Trans Day of Visibility a chart that explains and encourages gender affirming care and one of the things that they say is that puberty blockers and going on cross-sex hormones that that is reversible it is not reversible there are very serious physical lifelong repercussions with that if a young woman gets say she gets top surgery she's this is happening when they're 14 15 16 17 years old because she thinks that she's a boy for who knows what reason. Most of the time, these days, it's not actual gender dysphoria. And say she decides, as many do, that this was a mistake, that she is actually a woman. She knows that she's a woman and she wants to identify as that. And she wants to get reconstruction surgery. She wants to get breast implants. It's not the same. You lose feeling. You got all your milk ducts taken out. So you can't breastfeed anymore. I mean, this is abuse. And so for Texas, by the way, to say, hey, this is a form of abuse, to 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 put young children who just aren't mature enough to make these decisions 
through this kind of procedure and through these kinds of programs that have lifelong repercussions, negative repercussions, that is a form of abuse. And it starts with the power of suggestion. It starts with very often, not always, I understand young kids, there are a very small percentage of young kids that do actually have gender dysphoria, but it very often starts with the suggestion that, hey, maybe you aren't the sex that God gave you. Maybe you're something else. And so teachers who introduce young kids to this, who are so malleable, they don't have to deal with the long-term repercussions of this. Like the teachers and the psychologists and the doctors who encourage this young man to go on puberty blockers and to be chemically castrated, are they going to come to the funeral when this person unfortunately commits suicide because they weren't helped the way that they needed to be helped? Are they going to be the one sobbing their eyes out when this person can't get out of his deep depression and suicidal thoughts and can't ever live a normal life? No, those people are going to keep on getting paid. They don't care. They don't care. This is about money. This gender grooming is about ideology. It's about money. You as a parent need to stand up. The sex that your kid was born in is their sex. Help them learn to accept that. That's how you love them, by helping them love their body. And it is so worth every bit of pushback, every bit of respectful ruckus that we raise for this subject because kids are being mutilated and abused by this ideology. So when I see um, an article in Christianity Today by a certain Russell Moore, and you can read it, it's talking about the culture wars and how dangerous the culture wars are. And really, it comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of resentment. It comes from a place of just wanting to go viral and wanting to get clicks. And Christians shouldn't be a part of that because we should be okay with feeling humiliation because Christ felt humiliation when he was on the cross. It was just like one type of writing for that article too. Like he referenced way too many other books that it was actually very difficult to read. But the point of the article was that Christians really shouldn't be engaged in these um, kinds of culture and political wars online and things like that. Look, you can call it whatever you want to. You can try to... um invalidate these efforts. You can try to demean it as just an opportunity to go viral. The fact of the matter is, is that this affects people. These culture wars matter. Politics matter. Policy matters. People matter. And so the things that Russell Moore is trying to demean and belittle, saying that it's not becoming of a Christian to engage in these kinds of things or the way that he thinks is not, you know, is not right or not polite enough. I'm sorry. We've just got to dismiss that. We've got to keep pushing back because it actually matters. It affects people's lives. That's why this law matters. That's why what Ron DeSantis is doing matters. That's why all of our voices absolutely matter in this. It's affecting real people. All right, let me tell you about our last sponsor for the day. Speaking of politics really mattering and the things that we do and our voices really making a difference, uh, I want to tell you guys about pre-born. In the U.S., murder has become a wholesale business since Roe v. Wade. 25% of pregnant mothers do not choose life. The Ministry of Preborn and Blaze Media are partnering to help rescue 50,000 babies from abortion in 2022. We're calling them Blaze Babies, and we have already saved so many because of the donations of you guys. Preborn offers um, all different kinds of free services for mothers who are pregnant. They provide maternity and baby clothes, diapers, car seats, counseling, and so much more free of charge. They have counseled over 450,000 women over the past 15 years considering abortion and 188,000 babies have been saved. That is so amazing. They offer these free sonograms because they know that women are 80% more likely to choose life for her baby when they see the baby and when they see that heartbeat. So be a part of this. Uh, make a difference. Help rescue babies' lives to donate dial pound 250 and say keyword baby. That's pound 250 keyword baby or go to preborn.com slash Allie. That's preborn.com slash Allie. Okay, we only have time to react to one TikTok. I haven't seen it yet. So I don't know what my response is going to be. So um, let's see. Do we say them or the, they? Uh, you would say they if you, were saying, if you were talking about me and you were like, they are really awesome. Or if you said, I want to give this piece of candy to them. Get it? I like your hair. 
they. How, or how about if you knew, how about I like, <sighs> or how about. I like your hair of them, Mandy. <laughs> yeah, close enough. We'll work on the grammar later. That's pretty good, though. I like it. That's really sad. I mean, this person seems like a nice a nice person and I'm sure I'm sure she thinks that she's doing her best. Um but it really breaks my heart how confusing this is for kids. Kids are just starting to learn like pronouns when they're that age, they're just starting to learn grammar and you're going to tell them to use plural pronouns and are for a singular person. Do you understand how confusing that is? It's so important for kids to understand clarity, to understand definitions, to understand categories, to understand context. That's how they're making sense of the world. That's how they don't get overstimulated and overwhelmed constantly. That's why the family unit is so important. That's why them having a good relationship with their parents, a stable home is so important because the world is all new to them. It's all overwhelming. They're learning language and gender and who they are and who other people are. It's really important for them to be able to put other people into categories of male versus female. It helps them stay safe. It helps them also in reporting things like sexual abuse and any kind of interaction with someone that they need to tell their parent about. They need to be able to describe that person accurately. They need to be able to know the difference between themselves and someone else. It's really important for kids to know this category and know how to speak and know how to describe things out in the world. And the mass confusion and delusion we are putting on kids in the name of inclusion, in the name of empathy, um, is going to be so destructive. So Christians, let's be clearer than ever. It goes all the way back to Genesis 1. If we can't affirm Genesis 1, there's no way we can affirm the rest of Scripture. And let us push back against bad, destructive ideas with good, whole, and healthy ideas. And thankfully, the counsel of God gives us those things. We don't have to wonder what wisdom is. God gives us those things. And let us be completely unabashed in declaring those things and being a refuge of clarity and courage for the rest of the world who are victims of this kind of chaos and moral anarchy that we are seeing. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Get your merch. We will put the merch link in the description of this episode. We've got awesome t-shirts and we've got more things coming. We've got some of our favorite alliterations on t-shirts. So make sure that you go buy that. Guys, if you love this podcast, it would mean so much to us if you leave us a five-star review wherever you listen, especially on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Thank you guys. You are awesome. And we will see you back here on Monday.